So if you can name one of the robo advisors, name one of the robo advisors that you know of. Does anyone know any robo advisors firms? I'm going to try to see if uh, yes, we got oh good, we got Betterman. Okay, Betterman is actually one of the the, uh, the oldest one. Now we're talking about only five years old. It's considered old in robo advisor. Uh, Wealth Fund. Okay, great. Charles Schwab. Okay, very good. All right. So it's got um, we got a brand name here, the the Betterman here. Um, as a matter of fact, these are the top um, seven firms that the millennials actually prefer to do business with, and they range from Betterman's uh, Wealth Farm Front, also Charles Schwab is one of the uh, providers as well. And so by looking at that, the research has shown a couple of things. The robo-advisor will, and it actually is, replacing the traditional wealth management um, services. And people who are more likely to have positive emotion of using technology are the one chances are will be using the robo-advisors. And on top of it, robo-advisors is actually not individualized yet. So what does that mean? That means that you still have time to customize your services. You can leverage technology, but at the same time, you ought to be changing your business model a little bit. So then, you are still able to capture the growth of your firm. So all of that is great data. I can't help but to ask my own daughter. So my daughter is in the middle of the picture. Okay, let's see. So she's in the middle of the picture. This is when she was receiving her uh, Girl Scout Goal Award. Anybody have kids as in Girl Scout, Boy Scouts? Oh, yay! <laughs> So she was one of those that received, uh, received her goal um, award in Girl Scout. This was a picture that she was just about to graduate from high school. I love this picture. The reason is I can freeze it just to see that oh, I don't have to see her rebellion. <laughs> just a nice still picture there. Now, she's obviously grown up now. She's uh, financially independent from us, so we're very happy. She's working, she's studying, so that's really good. Now, if you were to ask her, so who is your advisor? Any guess? Shrop. Shrop? Anybody else? Mom. Mom. Yeah, of course, mom. Yeah. <laughs> Mommy is my advisor. Yeah, so uh, the interesting part about all these um, automations, robo-advisors, and all that, at the end of the day, this is what happened. There are five various different financial counseling services on the rise at the same time as robo-advisors on the rise. So that means that when the robo-advisor doesn't necessarily customize or individualize your client's work, you have additional opportunity to serve your clients. And these five counseling services surrounding the debt management, credit counseling, retirement, estate planning, savings, accumulations, all of that is part of the service that the clients are telling you we want that. So if you have not incorporated that into your service model, whether or not you are attorney's firms or CPA firms or financial planning firms, you really need to look at this. Because there is an a audience, and that audience is being serviced today by someone else other than you. So you really need to capture that. Um, what I'm going to do is just switch gear to look at some big data. From looking at the big data to see how can you impact uh, by using the big data, changing your business model a little bit there. All right, I'm going to show you a picture. This is a very nice picture about clients coming into you saying, I want to retire at age 55. Yes, a very popular answer, 55. And they have this rosy picture, right? They both look healthy not to mention good looking, right? They are on the beach, no one else is in the background. How odd, <laughs> right? And then they are so much enjoying their retirement, they are traveling around the world, and they have such a great time. They can't wait to get there. And for those of you sitting in this room servicing clients and discussing this topic, you know how realistic this picture is, right? <laughs> Uh, and so another 
the things to watch out for is not only that clients has a very different rosy picture of what retirement looks like, the planners, the economists also have a different picture. All of you using software to, to calculate how successful the clients would be, this is what the machine actually looks like. We are, if you look at the chart, this is a typical bell shape, right? Bell, bell curve shape chart. That means that assuming, how, uh, assuming that you start working young, can someone tell me how young you started working? 16, 16 25, 7, wow, that's fantastic. So on the left hand side, we started working, let's just settle for 20, how's that? We'll, we'll settle for 20, we started working from 20, and my salary continued to go up, there's no employment disruption, never. And the clients actually consistently save for retirement, consistently. And there's nothing happening in their life, everything's great. Until at some point, 55, right? We're saying 55. Until at 55, I say to myself, I save enough and I can start spending. Right? That's the decumulation state. You start going down here or there. And I start spending, and I'm going to be so disciplined spending that I will not overspend. As a matter of fact, and I will never get sick. And I will die exactly 90 years old with one penny left. <laughs> yes? Have you tell clients that that's exactly what's going to happen? So this is not a very realistic picture, right? One of the problem with that rosy picture of the retirement, also, this picture here is that it's not really realistic. And here is the problem. Like it or not, we don't die. We don't. Does anybody know what is the mortality rate in the U.S.? 100%. <laughs> I like that. I like that. 100%. All right, I'll come to that in just a moment. As a matter of fact, um, when I work with clients, oftentimes, other than look at the rosy picture and other than looking at the unrealistic uh, calculations of how successful you're going to get in retirement, this is the one question I want to know. What are you going to do? So I only want to know one thing. What will you do when you retire? Because we are not going to die immediately. Right? We're going to save about 20, 30 years, and we're going to spend that money for 40, 50, even 60 years. So what are you going to do? And as a matter of fact, many retired uh, clients will come and tell me that they are not fulfilling their life. They want to do something, but they didn't plan it out. And so oftentimes, this, uh, this is a movie that I'm sure some of you have seen this. What's the, what's the name of the movie? Yes. So this guy on the right actually became an intern. It's called senior intern. Not the level of the intern, it's the age senior intern. And he was contributing back his knowledge to this startup firm. So oftentimes, knowing your clients, what are they planning to do, makes a huge difference in terms of planning. Uh, so what I wanted to do is, can I actually feel, uh, see a realistic picture of how people are doing re during retirement? So I um, took up a project to look at statistically how things are. Uh, before I go there, I just want to introduce some terminology before I get going there. And for the CPA in the room, I apologize. This is not a real balance sheet. It's called retirement balance sheet. It has only two things, assets and liabilities, no equity, okay? So it's a little skew from your day-to-day -day work. So on the asset side, you can notice that there are several different types of assets. You have your human capital, you have your home equity, you have your financial, uh, uh, financial portfolio assets, then you have your social capital, then you have your direct investment in real estate and direct investment of businesses. We in this room, oftentimes only focusing on financial portfolio asset. That's where your IRA is, that's your 401k, that is your life insurance, annuity, and you name it. That's typically your focus, because that's how you get paid. But there are other assets not being considered, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. 
on the other side of the liabilities, all of these assets has a competing objective, and that is the liability side. Your living expenses, your discretionary, your contingency, as well as your goal. Now, we are very fortunate to work with clients that all have legacy goals. That's what we get to do. We plan for them, and so on and so forth. And so we're lucky just to help clients like that, but there are a lot of people simply don't even match up. Your assets doesn't even match up to the fixed expenses. So these are some terminology to be aware of. And I am performing a calculation, and this is a typical financial planning software. It's based on this formula. It's basically calculating by the end of this year how much asset I have if I spend X dollar amount a year. And here is the problem. We are guesstimating client's situation. We're guessing when a client will die. Some people tell me, well, we just use 90, 85 years old or 95 years old. How do you know? We don't. We just guesstimate. And we use an average market return since 1926. The average is 7.6% return. We use an average. But how do you know that return is going to be 7.6? We don't. And then the client's spending, we are assuming the client's going to spend equal amount since the day they retire to the day they die. That's not very realistic in this picture. And so this is based on the machine. Remember, the machine is the programming behind the software that we all use is assuming this formula here. So I wanted to find out what if I put this formula to test by using some other assumptions, some more flexible assumptions. So I went to the Census Department. I went to the U.S. Census Department and said, give me all the data in the U.S. who is 62 and above and is already receiving Social Security. And show me all the assets that they, they own, including their house, their um, accounts, uh, financial accounts, and everything else. I want to know all the asset materials in a particular household. So census data gave me those information, and then I went to Morningstar. I asked Morningstar to give me all the returns since 1926 all the way to 2018. And I'm going to be using the return based on year to year to year to year, not necessarily using just an average. Then, additionally, I went to the Social Security Administration. I want to know from Social Security Administration, how are they betting on us? As a matter of fact, they are betting on us to die young. Very young. Why? Did anybody know? They don't have, they don't, they, they are, hopefully that they don't run out of money, but as of the last time checked, they're in, by 2034, 2035, the trust fund will be depleted. Okay. But Social Security Administration has a table called Live Table. When you get back to the office, go Google it and go on to, to check on it. They have a table. They are betting that you might live until age 119. 119. They have a mortality table on each one of us knowing what is your probability of survival until age 119. So, yeah, that's what I was telling you. We don't die. With all the robot coming through, we probably will never die. And that would be a problem because you may not have enough assets for that. 